Well, here I am again, and we are moving on to Revelation chapter 4. And as you can tell, to start the rapture off right, I went and buzzed my hair. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, Sandy, Kimberly, we are going to start in... Um, you notice I just keep saying Sandy and Kimberly now, because I started this off for you, Sandy, but, but Kimberly wants them too. And you know you like this, Kimberly, so, so don't you say you Um chapter 4 verse 1 in the book of Revelation is where we are <clears throat> and so let's see what we have here chapter 4 verse 1 after this I looked now this is John talking okay we're not writing in red letters anymore okay after this I look now what is he saying after this immediately after what after everything that he was just telling you in the previous chapters. Now, what were the previous chapters? The church age. Remember this. So, after the church age, the end of the church age is what he's talking about. Not like hundreds of years after the church is gone. But what he's referring to is at the point that the church comes up to and stops. That moment, right then and there. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Now, who opens the door? Jesus. No one but Jesus opens the door. No one but Jesus can close the door. Remember, we was talking about that last time. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. Now, who was it that was talking to him as the voice of a trumpet? Jesus. All right. What does Jesus say here? Which said, come up hither or come up here. And I will shew these things or show you things which must be hereafter or in other words in the future all right what john is seeing is a picture of the rapture if you go back to the book of exodus and you look at the book of exodus you look to when at the um the, the Hebrew slaves, they were led out. You remember, they were led out into the wilderness. Moses was leading, and his brother Aaron. They were basically the leaders of, of all these millions of people. There was roughly about three million of them. Um, and they were leading them out through, and they come to a mountain. And you, if you remember the story correctly, you remember Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments of God. And that can just get into a long thing. But my point is this. At one point in the book, you, you have to study it. There's one point in the book where there's an interesting verse. The Lord tells Moses, the trumpet shall be blown. And when the trumpet is blown on the last time, the people shall come up hither. The mountain always represents God and his majesty to begin with. Paul would tell us, and I believe it's either in Corinthians or Thessalonians, but Paul would tell us at the last trump, it's the same thing here. There was a series of trumps. Now, there's different trumpet blasts for different things in the Old Testament. There was one for war. There was one for peace. There was one for eating. There, there was all these different trumpet blasts. But there was a succession of blasts played on the trumpet during this when the Lord was telling them to come up. Anyway, my point is this. Just like it was in the Old Testament. Remember I told you I'd throw in some things here and there just to parallel, to show you. See, the rapture is not just something that a lot of people say, oh, well, it come about in the 1800s, people preaching this in the 1800s. No, 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 no. That's wrong. All right. The word rapture that we use today comes from a Latin word of the Latin word rapia more. Okay, and it's found in the Latin Vulgate. If you go back and find the Latin Vulgate, you can probably find it online maybe. You're not going to be able to get a copy of it just to read it. I don't think you can. Or if you could, it would probably cost you several hundred dollars. The original was written in the... Oh, Lord, way back yonder. A long time before the King James Bible was ever thought about. And that was 1611 when the King James Version of the Bible was coming to existence. So, I mean, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before then, Latin Vulgate. And like I said, the word repimor is where we get the word rapture from, the rapture of the church. The word rapture literally means to gather away. And it's... Um, the reason a lot of people argue against it is because you do not see the word rapture in the Bible. 
Well, guess what? You don't see the word Trinity in the Bible, but I believe that God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are three in one that are Trinity, they're triune being. You don't see the word Trinity in the Bible. You don't see the term once saved, always saved mentioned in the Bible, so people argue against that. They have this stigma that if it's not mentioned per se in the Bible, that it's not real. Well, there's lots of things not mentioned in the Bible that are real. There's lots of things in the Bible that are symbolic that reference things going on. Did you know, Sandy, Kimberly, did you know the airplanes are in the Bible in the Old Testament? Did you know that computers are in the Bible? That televisions are in the Bible? There's so many things in Scripture, but it's hidden in the Scripture. It's not just boom, there's the word television, so I know television's in the Bible. It doesn't work that way a lot of times with God because God is wanting us to study to show ourselves proved, not just to read it. Anyway, back to Revelation. I went way off course, didn't I? Back to Revelation. The rapture happens. The church age is over. Let's see what John says. Verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit. Now you notice this is a little s, not a big s. So in other words, he was caught up in his spirit was taken from him. Just like the rapture. When the rapture happens to us, we're going to be changed immediately. In the twinkling of an eye, we will put off this mortal and put on immortal. We'll be like Jesus. We'll be changed into a spiritual being and taken up. This is what was going on with John. Now, John didn't literally leave from the Isle of Patmos. He was there. But his spirit was taken. Okay? This this is kind of hard for our minds to understand. Um, it's kind of like the, the whole deal. If you go back and read the book of Acts and you find Peter sitting up on top of the house, a lot of people call it a trance. That, that's not really a good word, but at the same time, um, it, it kind of has a little bit of that to it. It's a lot more than that because we're dealing with God, not in something fake. But um, anyway, so immediately he was in his spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now that's pretty self-explanatory. I don't really think I have to get into it much. But let's, let's look at what's said here, verse 3. And he that sat, talking about sat on the throne, was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone or a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, or around the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. All right, see, immediately, we're only three verses into this chapter, and we're already getting into some very symbolic and descriptive words. This is the reason the book of Revelation is hard for people to understand, because they do not want to take the time and let the Spirit reveal to them what is being seen. I'll tell you what he's being, what's seen here. John sees a throne. And he sees someone sitting on this throne. All right. It says, the throne looked like a jasper and a sardine stone. All right. The, t the term jasper, the word jasper in the Bible means brilliancy. Anytime you see the word jasper, think of something brilliant, something that's just eye-catching, something, you know, beaming with glory maybe, you know, even. All right? And a sardine stone. All right? This stone is a red stone denoting blood. Why is this important? Because the blood is of Jesus that he shed at the cross is what sealed the covenant between the Father and man. Every covenant between God and man, from Adam and Eve all the way down, always has to have a blood signature to it. All right? And there was a rainbow. Imagine this. A rainbow around the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Now, why is that important? Because emeralds are green. This rainbow is solid green. Green in the Bible means mercy. In the Greek, what we're seeing here is what's called the Bema. What the Bema is, is the mercy seat. In the court system during the time that Jesus walked on earth in Rome, there was two places that a person would stand. 
They would either stand where they were guilty or they would stand where they were innocent. If they were standing where they were innocent, they were standing at the bema. Okay? He is seeing a solid green. This is the mercy seat, what he's seeing. In other words, he's seeing... He's seeing the emerald throne. Okay? The mercy seat. This is what he's seeing here is the judgment of the saints about to happen. Not the lost, the saints, those that are saved. Only the saved are going up in the rapture. Okay? There's there's no lost person going up in the rapture. The rapture just happened and immediately he's taken to this. Alright? Now let's look on. This is God the Father, by the way, sitting on this throne. Verse 4. And round about the throne, here we go again. A minute, a minute ago we had a rainbow around it. Now let's see what we have around it. There's 24 seats. It says 4 and 20 seats, which is just Old English for 24. 24 seats. And upon the seats I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. This is a really good verse. The number 24 in the Bible means the priesthood. The Bible says that we are of a royal priesthood. Okay. What John is seeing here in verse 4 are the saved. He's seeing the church. He's seeing all of those who have washed their souls in the blood of the Lamb. He, he's seeing all of us that are redeemed. Okay? 24. That doesn't mean there's just literal 24. It's symbolic denoting the church. And if you notice, there's a couple of things interesting about this. One, they're clothed in white raiment. Again, you remember that was one of the promises. One of the promises was that those who overcome, overcame would be clothed in white raiment. This white raiment. In other words, we will have this on because we will be perfect. We'll be pure. We'll be holy. We'll be righteous. We'll be just. We'll be like him. That, that's that's mind-boggling, but we're, that's where we're headed. Another thing says that they had on their heads crowns of gold. Gold means kingship, but we're not kings. So why would we have on crowns of gold? The Bible says that we are rewarded crowns for our works. You remember the church age, all through the church age, he was constantly judging the works, not the fruits, but the works of people. And the reason being is because whether you're lost or you're saved, your works depend on the type of crowns you get. Now, this is going to blow your mind because it blows my mind too. And a lot of people argue with this, but they argue with me anyway. But here's the thing, Sandy and Kimberly. A person that's saved, that gets to heaven, their crowns that they receive are from their good deeds in this life. It, those crowns will essentially, um, I don't want to say trade off, but it's kind of like um, depending on all the blessings that, we, that each person will receive in eternity, is based on the amount of crowns that they received due to what they've done in this life. All right. Now that does not mean that when we get up there, somebody's going to have more than somebody else, and there's going to be pride going on. Well, you got more than I got. And all that, that ain't got nothing to do with it, because we're dealing we're dealing on a plane so far up above man's intellect and mind and all that. But the reason I brought that up is because here's where the argument comes in that a lot of people argue with you about if you say anything about this. But lost people are also receiving due to their deed in this life. In other words, if you take two lost people, and this is even bad to talk about, but I'm using it as an example to prove my point. If you take two lost people and one person said maybe they lived a perfectly good moral life. They didn't do anything wrong. They didn't break laws. They didn't hurt people. You know, that they, they were a good moral person, and then they died without Jesus. They're going to hell. 
Then you take another person who just lived like hell itself on this earth. You know, they murdered people, they stole, they did. I mean, they just did everything that everything that you could think of that's not good to do. They ended up in hell too. Well, once both of these two end up in hell, the one that lived the morally good life is not going to have it as bad, if that makes any sense, as the one who did all the other stuff. It's still going to be bad. It, there, there's no way anything can be good in hell. But my point is, on levels, if that makes any sense, his level of punishment, his level of being bad, things happening to him during that time will not be as bad as the other one. Does, does that make sense? Okay. So we see these. We see the church clothed in white with crowns on their head from the good from the deeds that they've done in this life. There's one more thing about it. It says that and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting. Now what's interesting about this is they're not standing, they're not walking, they're sitting. Why? Because they're resting. Their work is done. Everything that we had to do in this life, everything that we had to suffer for, everything that we went through and all the persecutions and everything else it might be, we fought the good fight of faith. We run the race. We stayed the course. We won the prize. We're sitting. We're resting. Okay. Another thing about this too, and I'll go ahead and mention this, is a lot. I've heard a lot of ministers say, well, you don't want to get to heaven and not have any crowns to lay at Jesus' feet. Well, the only problem with that statement is that's impossible. Because every saved person has at least one. And that one crown is the crown for salvation itself. So everybody has at least one. There's not going to be anybody standing before Jesus that doesn't have anything at all. All right. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do for him, you know, and so we'll have more. But I'm just saying that everybody's going to have one. They ju I just proved it right there in verse 4. They had on their heads. It didn't say some of them had it and some of them didn't. Every one of them had on their heads crowns of gold. Alright, let's look at verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. We keep covering the seven spirits of God. Now here they are manifested before the throne. Again, we're dealing with the believer's judgment. All right, the lightnings equal power or mean power, stand for power. The thunderings represent might, and the voices represent majesty. Okay, the seven spirits before the throne. Okay, it says that, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. The seven lamps are the seven burning candles, which we were seeing back in chapter 1, verses 12 and verse 20. Um... <laughs> I have a little note here I put down. I'd like to read this. It says, This tells me that even out of the worst church at Laodicea, there will be souls that are saved. Praise the Lord. Absolutely. Amen. I, I, I think I've alluded to that on the last video. The, the Laodicean church represents the lost church, but that doesn't mean that there won't be people during the lost church age to get saved during that church age. See, out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings of voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. That his arm is not too short to reach. No matter how far down we are, you know, he's always there. I mean, it's just, these things are amazing to me. And so many people don't pick up on them. I mean, so many people act like, well, James, you're, as a matter of fact, in the last couple of days I've been called, We'll see. I've been called that I'm preaching heresy on Facebook now, that I have a big ego, that I'm full of pride. I mean, these types of things. And I'm sorry that I come across like that when I'm typing. They don't hear me talking like y'all are hearing me now, but I can't make a video for every single thing that I want to share. If I did, my life would be consumed in front of this little camera here. It's not that I'm trying to have a big ego or prideful. I'm just trying to explain to people and people just don't know I guess they don't know how to take me I don't I don't know I don't mean anything harmful towards it but at the same time it is what it is like I, I'm not put here to please people either I'm put here to do his will and if people are convicted or are troubled by what I share with them well, then they need to take it up with him and not me I'm just a messenger I have nothing to do with that verse 6 and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts 
full of eyes before and behind. Now the sea of glass, of course, is clear. It, uh, you can, in other words, you can see through it. But it represents perfection. It's, um, it's so translucent that it's almost, it's almost hard to imagine. I mean, this, this is not just like glass like we have here, like in a window pane behind me or, you know, window even in your car or something like that. No, th this glass is, well, look at it again. And before the throne, there was a sieve glass like unto crystal. If you ever seen, you know, something crystal, it's made out of pure crystal, you know, and it's even more brilliant than that. You know, I mean, it's just these things, these these attributes, these adjectives that are given to the stuff. <sighs> Poor John, he had a hard time. I imagine, I, I I feel for him because I have a hard time explaining what I'm trying to show people. Sometimes I can only imagine what it must have been for him to try to explain to people that were not seeing these things what it must have been like to see it. Um. The four beasts full of eyes, these are servants of God able to see all things. Now, they, they could be angels, they could be personas of God. It, it could be a different, many different things. There's, there's, different, um, there's different levels of angels. I mean, you have plain angels like messengers. You have uh, cherubim, you have seraphim, you have archangels. You, you have, it just on and on. There's, there's all these different ranks in his army, so to speak. And all that, but whoever these be these beasts are, um, they they show forth the omniscience, the omnipotence, the omnipresence. They they, they show forth these things of God, His whole attribute. Let's look at verse seven. Verse seven kind of explains it. Verse seven is a really good verse. Verse seven is the number of perfection. All right, and the first beast was like a lion. And the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Alright, now, it's interesting. This verse parallels to another verse in the Old Testament. If you go back to, to Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, and you look in chapter 1, and you turn to verse 10, um, you will see that these things are mentioned, but they're just a little bit different. They're a little bit different, but it still means the same thing. Let me just read what I have on my notes right here because it'll just be easy, a bit quicker. And this is already over 20 minutes. All right. The four beasts are described as number one, lion. Lion represents the king. Jesus said, what did he say? I am the lion of the tribe of Judah. Kingship, royalty. Number two, calf. Calf is, uh, in, in Ezekiel, mentions oxen. But a calf is still a form of a cow or whatever. Okay, it's a beast of burden. It's carrying the weight of sin. What did Jesus do? He said, come to me, you all you who are heavy laden and burdened. You know, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is light. Cast your cares upon me. All right? Number three, man, the son of man, God's favorite part of creation. All right? Jesus took on the persona of mankind. He's spirit. He's God 100%. But he came down and took on our embodiment to show forth what man should do for him. Verse, I mean, number four, uh, eagle. Eagle represents majesty, one and only God. Eagles do not fly in groups or in flocks. If you notice, an eagle soars alone. He soars by himself. These same beasts are described also in Ezekiel 1.10 and Ezekiel 10.14. However, in 10.14, the calf oxen is represented as a cherubim, showing servanthood nonetheless. These imageries are all depictions of the wonderful persona and glory of God. They're all also representing Jesus himself. Jesus is round about the throne. And the reason being is because Jesus is our advocate. He's our lawyer. He's the one that's going to take up for us before the Father. When we're standing before the Father guilty, it doesn't matter. I'm going to be as guilty as a lost person when I stand before the Father. Only because Jesus steps forth and says, James called upon me to, to uh, save his soul, to wash him clean in October 1998, whatever the date was. That ain't the point. The point is it happened. But my point is this, Jesus is going to say, Father, my blood is on him. He is mine, and what you have given me shall not be taken away. And instantly, instantly, the Father is going to say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into thy rest. You know, th this, 
I'm sorry to keep going back on this. I, I, I just, golly, it just eats at me so bad when I hear all these people talking about what we must do to be saved. They are just turning, they're turning scriptures into a work manual that man wrote. They're not, they're not taking this by faith. They're not applying this to their life with faith. They're not, they're taking the glory and majesty away from God and the work that Jesus did for us and trying to transpose it into something that we're supposed to do for him. They're trying, they're trying to water down the gospel and mix in these things that, that are just not right. Verse 8, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. What is six times four? Twenty-four. And they were full of eyes within the wings. The six wings. They had eyes all in these wings. All right? And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. These personas of Christ each had six wings covering sin. Now this, here we go, alluding again. If you go back to the book of Isaiah, look at chapter 6 of Isaiah. The seraphims each had six wings. Jesus is being praised constantly forever by these beings. Okay? Which, like I said, the persona is him himself. Alright? But they are... They're literally there worshiping him. See, all this stuff is mind-boggling to us because if you try to rationalize it and try to put it into something that you can understand in this life, it will never make any sense because we have not seen these things. John is the only one to ever see these things in the fullness. All right? Now, I heard Perry Stone make a statement here recently I thought was pretty interesting, and I've never looked into it, so I don't know the credibility of it. But he made a statement in... And I can't disagree with him, like I said, because I, I don't know. But he said he believes that what John was seeing was everything that the prophets were seeing in the Old Testament. And it could be. I just mentioned Ezekiel. I just mentioned Isaiah. You know, it very well could be. They saw little bit, bits and pieces. John's seeing the whole picture, you know. Hey, if it is, praise God for it. I mean, that's, you know, great revelation to me. You know, I'm not going to argue with it. Okay. Verse 9, And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, verse 10, there was a comma there, the four and twenty elders, the church, fall down and before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, I'm going to go ahead and finish it, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure... They are and were created. All right. That just reconfirms the fact that this cannot be lost people here. Because <laughs> only the church will take off the crowns and cast them at Jesus' feet. The lost do not do that. The lost do not receive crowns. They receive leniency is what they receive. I guess that's the best word. They receive leniency for their good deeds. We receive crowns for our good deeds. Okay. The church falls down. It says, When those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne and lived forever and ever. The tw when does it say that they give things? Look back in verse, a verse before that. They rest not day and night. They never rest. They're constantly giving things. Then it turns around and says, When they give thanks, which is constantly, what are we doing? We're constantly praising him. We're constantly worshiping him. We're constantly laying at his feet crowns of glory and honor and majesty and all these things that it says because he is worthy to receive these things. He is the one that's done it all. He completed the work at Calvary on the cross 2,000 years ago. Now all we are doing is standing in his stead here on this earth trying to reach out to those that are in darkness for him because when everything is final and said and done it's not going to matter about what James said on this camera it's not going to matter about what James typed on Facebook it's not going to matter about how many friends James has in life or what kind of job James had what kind of degree James had did James work uh, have a lot of money did James have a house did James have a job did James have a wife did James have kids none of those things are going to matter all that is going to matter in the finality of all is what did James do with Jesus himself 
Is James born again or is James lost? If James is born again, then James is going to be right here doing these things I just read. If he's not, then James is in for a rude awakening because James is going to be cast into the lake of fire at the end of the book of Revelation that we'll get to well down the line. But my point is this, Sandy. My point is this, Kimberly. Praise the Lord Jesus that I know that I am saved, I am sealed, and I am set apart for his glory. I praise the Lord that you are too, Sandy. I praise the Lord that you are too, Kimberly. And thank you so much, Kimberly, for telling me what you said about dedicating your baby to the Lord. I, oh, wow. Man, I just feel the Holy Spirit on that so much right now. Praise God for it. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you so much for that revelation, Lord. But I'm going I'm to... Oh, I'm just going to leave you right there before I begin preaching because I'll turn this thing into a three or four hour video. So hallelujah and praise God for it. And I hope that this enlightens y'all. I know it's enlightened me already some. And I just hope to keep on studying, keep on reading, and keep on getting enlightened. How about that? <laughs> hallelujah praise God. Talk to y'all soon.